Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Matthew Friedel. I'm a senior lecturer at uh, UWM in the School of Information Studies. I'm co-founder of the Disruptive Technologies Lab and an angel investors with Silicon Pastures Angel Investment Network. In this presentation, I'm going to talk about artificial intelligence and specifically blockchain. So what I'd like to cover today is what's the current state of AI and briefly address what we call the hype cycle. Um, define what AI and machine learning is. Um, some common applications, and then we're going to get into a use case specifically related to healthcare. And then finally, I'll talk a little bit about what UWM is doing in this space. Um, so let's start with a couple quotes here. This is the CEO of Google. Machine learning is a core transformative way by which we are rethinking how we were doing everything. Here is the uh, CEO of Microsoft, a UWM alumni. Artificial intelligence is the defining technology of our time. It's going to be AI at the edge. It's going to be AI in the cloud. It's going to be AI as a part of SaaS applications, AI as a part, in fact, even infrastructure. So those are some pretty powerful statements. Um, let's start with a question I get on occasion here in my artificial intelligence class. Will ro robots take my job? And I want to reframe that a little bit because what I want you to think about over the course of time, technology and more specifically automation has changed the type of work that we're going to do. In fact, we're going to see specifically how it's changing healthcare. But we used to have telephone operators and we used to have bowling pin setters and we used to have ice cutters. And all of them have now been replaced with uh, differing types of jobs. And the same thing is going to happen with AI. It is going to transform how we do some work, but it's going to transform work into higher economic value. And there will be changes in blue collar and white collar jobs, and we just need to be aware of it and identify the trends um, that we take a look at. So um, what's interesting is you can't pick up a, a business publication without seeing headlines about uh, companies are killing themselves to be tech companies. There's an arms race and AI. Um, there's a concept called uh, the technology hype cycle, and Garner produces this every single year. This is going back to 2018. They map AI and a lot of other technologies on this curve, and it's early innovators, the peak of inflated expectations, the trough of disillusionment, and then we get into um, you know, plateau of productivity and a slope of enlightenment. And what it means is that there's a lot of hype related to it, and the follow-through isn't quite there yet. But what they can do is they can map out, okay, how many years before we begin to see some of these technologies evolve? Now, this is already going back two years, and you can see that um, in the next five to ten years, um, AI and some of the subsets are going to be very material. Virtual assistants, I have two of them in my kitchen right now. Uh, deep neural networks are on the cusp right now. They're being used in many different uh, type of industries. So as long as we identify that and recognize that sometimes the technologies don't always deliver what they're promised, we should be able to adequately address whether they're uh, right for our organization or our company. Uh, oops, I'm going to go back here for a second. So this is an interesting uh, slide right here. We're very close to the peak of fintech. There are more than 10,000 startups in this boom. And I would say right now with AI and to a lesser extent blockchain, we're almost in the same era that we were with respect to um, the birth of the web or the creation of mobile and social media. And what I mean by that is we're going to have many, many companies that are going to be successful, create lots of economic opportunity for us, create lots of jobs, create lots of wealth, and there will be a lot of companies that go bust. Um, so we will have Amazon.coms and we have Pets.coms. And what I want you to think about is that there will be winners and losers, but uh, at the end of the day, the average person is going to benefit from all of these um, products and services that are created by these particular companies. So let's start with some definition. AI is a simulation of human intelligence processed by machines, especially computers. This includes uh, learning and reasoning. If you want even a more simple definition, uh, let's take a look at this. A program that can sense, reason, act, and adapt. Very basic. So we're not programming these with conditional expresses. If this happens, else this happens. They are learning from experiences. They are learning from data. And we're going to see that that's going to be a powerful combination when we get to the healthcare side. Um, how about some key characteristics? So how about autonomy, the ability to perform tasks in a complex environment without constant guidance by a user? 
How about adaptivity, the ability to improve performance by learning through experiences? Again, we're feeding it data, we're feeding it experiences, and it's learning from that, machine learning. In fact, we'll see what the definition of that is in a second here. So let's think about the taxonomy of AI. So a bigger sphere, we have computer science um, or information studies, that's the school that I'm in. Within that sphere, we have artificial intelligence. Within that sphere, we have machine learning. Within that uh, sphere, we have uh, deep learning. And then off to the side, we have an overlapping circle, which is data science. And data science can be just traditional statistics and be linear regression analysis. Um, but if you add in, again, this learning aspect to it, then it goes over into the area of artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, etc. So data science can cover uh, both realms in those circumstances. So what is machine learning? Machine learning is an application of artificial intelligence that provides systems the ability to automatically learn and improve experiences while being programmed. And not to go into too uh, deep of detail here, but there's really three areas under machine learning. There's supervised learning. We know what the classifications are. We have pictures of dogs, we have pictures of cats, and we know um, you know what what those characteristics are that's for like forecasting predicting diagnosis customer attention fraud detection etc let's say that we don't exactly know what the labels are but we think that there's an underlying structure of our data and we'll call this clustering and this would fall under the area of like your netflix in fact we're going to see that in, ex uh, in an example so i'm a netflix watcher who likes documentaries and sci-fi shows so those are kind of categories that we can clump into and it helps with customer segmentation target marketing content recommendation systems and then the last one is reinforced learning which is really the technology behind say the, the brain of self-driving autonomous vehicles, real-time decision-making, robotic navigation, skills ac acquisitions, et cetera. Um, you will also hear machine learning sometimes uh, used synonymously with big data. And I love this quote from Scott Page here from the University of uh, Michigan. Companies are increasingly trying to harness the rolling hairball of data that they're collecting on a ba daily basis. So just because they have a lot of data doesn't mean that they have big data. So what I mean by that is what we're trying to do with our machine learning, which is really rooted in statistics, is extract knowledge from our data. That's the key piece. If we have a collection of data, collection of information, we want to extract some type of knowledge in this. And on the medical side, it's going to be um, a, a couple different areas, but think about diagnosis. I mean, if we have a collection of um, images or we have a collection of data, we want to be able to extract some type of knowledge of that. And in fact, we'll see that in the use case that we take a look at. So just briefly, how can uh, businesses use AI? It's going to change the way that they understand and interact with their customers. It's going to offer more intelligent products and services. It's going to improve um, and automate business processes. We'll see these all along the way. Um, what is the power of AI? Again, everybody's concerned that their job is going to be replaced, but what I would suggest is it's really a, a collection of powerful tools that improve decision-making, operational processes, aspects of customer service, and it enables employees to focus on duties of higher economic value. That's really the power of, of AI in this circumstance. And the best outcome is an AI and human machine team working together. What do I mean by that? What are humans really, really good at? Well, creativity, improvisation, dexterity, judgment, social and leadership abilities. What are machines really good at? Speed, accuracy, predictive capabilities, scalability. If you combine those two together, that's the secret sauce. That's when we get these, uh, these powerful products. Um, let's take a look at a, a couple examples. So uh, self-driving cars, uh, Tesla obviously is an example of that. It combines a couple different things. It's going to be planning from A to B. If you've used any kind of um, mapping application, you've seen that computer vision to read the road signs. It is a stop sign. It's a speed sign. And then uh, again, we need a decision making uh, mechanism under certainty. A ball bounces into the road and we have to make a decision in that. And all these have to work flawlessly together in order to um, avoid accidents. And this is applicable to a lot of different um, 
uh, applications. It could be robots, it could be flying drones, it could be autonomous ships. We're going to see a whole spectrum of those across um, different industries. What about content recommendation systems? Well, probably on a daily basis, you don't know this, but your Facebook feed, your Twitter, your Instagram, online advertising, your Netflix, your HBO, those are tailored towards you. They are personalized uh, in terms of the content basically that you're getting. They're taking a look at uh, your preferences and preferences of individuals in your category, and then they're offering you up documentaries like on Netflix or on HBO or something like that. And then the algorithms that are uh, determining this behind the scenes are essentially based in AI. Uh, one more. So we have uh, image and video processing. Facial recognition is used in a whole bunch of commodities in terms of businesses and customer um, support things, government applications. Um, I'm a part of Global Entry that allows me to streamline through and going through customs. If you've ever uploaded an image on Instagram or uh, Facebook or a friend has and your picture's in there, it can do auto-tagging. Um, and then this can be applied to a whole bunch of different other industries in terms of trying to make an estimates of wildlife and uh, other uh, recognizing other types of objects. Um, AI can also be used to generate and uh, alter content. Um, all right. So whether we like Big Brother or not, uh, the DHS has uh, said that facial recognition will be used in 97% of departing airports over in the next five years. So this technology is here, um, it's here to stay, and it's going to be utilized um, in terms of some level of surveillance state. So let's take a look at healthcare. Um, there's two areas that I'm going to talk about before we go into the use case. Let's think about research and clinical decision support. So AI can provide recommendations and support at the time and locations where phys physicians are making their decisions, which helps the physician provide the best service possibility. Now let's give an example of that. So IBM Watson Supercomputer was given an algorithm and sent and take a look at clinical records, notes sections, and other data, and it learned uh, key markers and predictive for congenitive heart failure. After an analyzing 21 million patient records in six weeks, the code achieved an 85% accuracy in identifying patients at risk of developing con congenitive heart failure in one year. So we're feeding it that data and it's learning from that, and then it can provide outcomes, which is, okay, what are the risk factors in terms of you having congenitive heart failure? How about a second area, uh, medical imaging? So similar to CDS tools, imaging uh, powered AI allows physicians with additional information that can help more quickly and accurately diagnose conditions. Again, an algorithm can be written, for example, to review millions of different chest films with and without malignancies and then learn to stop, uh, spot those malignancies. The goal is to enhance the healthcare provider's uh, decision-making. Again, we're not taking away from what the doctor is. We're having that human machine team working together so that we can get a diagnosis much faster. So let's take a look at um, uh, a company called Elsevier, if you're familiar with them or not familiar with them. So they're a global media publishing business. They offer more than 2,000 publications for education, professional science, healthcare uh, communities, books, journals, etc. So in the United States, two patients of the same age and gender will be presented the same symptoms to their healthcare practitioners, and they can get huge variations in outcomes and cost and the treatment basically that they received. This is due to diagnosing and treating being done by different healthcare staffs with different levels of knowledge and experiences, as well as personal feelings about which treatments are more effective. So uh, Elsevier developed an AI-driven pathways for initial examination um, to treatments and then ultimately uh, prescription med uh, medicine diagnosis. Um, so how is AI used? So ELSA is building an advanced uh, clinical decision support platform with natural language processing and machine learning to suggest optimal treatment paths for patients. It's able to correlate the data with the patient's records as well as the vast research publications through medical journals. Again, we have a collection of data and then we're ge uh, gleaming knowledge from that data. So ELSAview uses uh, contacts including books, journals, to map diseases to symptoms, which is allowed to create a predictive model, which is uh, what we're looking for. So what are the results? Um, uh, an adherence rate of 85% among uh, clinical staff to treat pathways provided by the platform. Uh, patients are uh, rest assured that they're getting the best care possible and then the best outcomes uh, out of those circumstances. 
So uh, just briefly, what is UWM doing in this space? Um, we have a couple initiatives. We have a couple platforms. We have a couple institutions. I co-founded the Disruptive Technologies Lab to do um, seminars like this, um, create new classes, work with industry professionals on this. We have the Northwestern Mutual Data Science Institute, which is a correlation, uh, which is a collaboration between UWM, Marquette University, and Northwestern Mutual Life. We have the Connected Systems Institute and the Lou Barb Center of Entrepreneurship. Uh, prior to COVID, I was working on a couple um, hackathons and seminars that were going to be hosted in both of those facilities. Strong connections to our strategic partners in the business community, including Rockwell and Microsoft in the Milwaukee area. Um, and then the Lou Barb Center of Entrepreneurship is unique because at UWM, we just don't teach the technology. We also teach um, entrepreneurial and design thinking. So it's infused right into our curriculum. So you come into my class and you'll learn about artificial intelligence and you'll learn about blockchain, but you'll also learn about how do you take a product or service from an idea to something that's usable for the um, you know your customer, uh, which I think is a powerful combination, and we need that. And what's interesting about that is everybody thinks about you know entrepreneurship as the startup, ramen noodles, small group. It's needed in large companies as well. It's needed as large companies. So even if you never work for a startup, the lean launch um, business model canvas. Uh, strategy that they teach in there is critical and helps companies uh, be able to evolve. So I want to thank you so much for your time today. I hope this was of uh, benefit. If any of this resonates with you, feel free to reach out. There's my email. Easier uh, probably just to connect on LinkedIn and mention that you saw this um, presentation. I routinely post about the hackathons that we do. I routine, routinely post about um, the various activities that we're doing through the Lubarb Center of Entrepreneurship and the Connected Systems Institute. So I would love to uh, connect with you. Thank you again for your time today. Uh, have a wonderful day.